Welcome to the LA Business Podcast, your destination to hear stories of how businesses grow and scale. I'm Robert Brill, CEO of Brill Media and the host of this podcast. Now, let's jump right into this week's interview. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the LA Business Podcast. Today our guest is Anthony Zhang, co-founder and CEO of VinoVest. Uh, Anthony Zhang recently turned 26 and has already built, uh, successfully built and sold two companies. We definitely want to talk about that. You secured funding from Mark Cuban and Mark Burnett and received a Thiel Fellowship grant. So there's a lot of a lot going on there. Um, this is fantastic. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about the companies you founded in the past and um, tell us about VinoVest. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me on, Robert. And um, I guess I can kind of start when I built my first company, Envoy Now, as a freshman in college. So I had just gotten to USC, and within the first couple of months, I realized how tough it was to be able to get food outside of the cafeterias. Everything closed pretty early, and being a hungry, lazy, lazy college student who needed money, I was just doing deliveries for, uh, for a few friends. So we, you know, we'd run to Chipotle, and I'd bring home a few extra burritos and charge people a delivery fee just to make some money. And uh, for my roommate and I, it was a pretty fun side hustle. Uh, really turned into more seriously uh, business when I had the opportunity a few months later to pitch Mark Cuban and, and Mark Burnett, and we were able to secure our first investment on uh, on stage at our school, which was a, a pretty life changing changing experience. How, how does that come about? Because I've 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 uh, I've never been in 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 the airspace as it were, the breathing space of Mark Cuban and whatnot. How, how, how does that come to be? So he was a guest speaker at our school and we weren't really scheduled to pitch or anything like that. However, at the end of his session, we still had some extra time left and he was just picking students that wanted to pitch him right out of the audience. And I was just waving my arm like crazy and lo and behold, he picked me. I was not prepared at all, but gave it my best and was able to, to walk out with an offer for 100K for 10% of my business. So really, the fundamental definition of um, luck is opportunity Absolutely. and preparedness, right? Yes. <laughs> That's I, I amazing. I was very nervous, but I'm very glad that it ended up working out. And how, how old were you when that happened? Um, this was like 19 or 20. I think it was 19, <laughs> yeah. It's such a stark difference. At 19 or 20, I couldn't figure out the difference between my hand and my elbow. Like it was. <laughs> I, I, I'm still there, but uh, <laughs> it was it was incredible because having someone like him, obviously, was achieved so much success, and he had never finished college either. Really gave me the confidence to actually be like, all right, I don't need to wait four years for an undergrad degree or like another another two years for an MBA. Uh, I should probably just grab the bull by the horns right now while it's taken off. And what and what and what exactly what type of business was it that he invested in? Envoy Now was a food delivery app for college campuses. Oh, okay. So think of a, a Postmates or Uber Eats, but we were only available on college campus, and it was only within the student community. And what and what happened to that business? So we grew that business out over the course of the next four or so years, expanded to twenty two campuses had a little over 150,000 students using the app and ultimately sold it to another company called Joyrun that got acquired by Walmart last year. No kidding. Wow. What did you learn? What What are some of the ups and downs that you experienced uh, with that business? Oh boy. I mean, being a 18-year-old CEO, you what's there not to learn, right? So I, I really just treated it as my formal education. I was learning a lot about recruiting, learning a lot about the types of people that you want and don't want in your business, especially at the early stage. Um, and for me, I also learned that food delivery is really hard. It's a low margin business. It's something where you need massive scale to be able to operate pro properly. And a difference between a five minute delay in delivery time and an on-time delivery is a huge difference when someone's hangry and, and your burrito is about to get cold. So, right, customers are the worst as a customer. Yes. Like I'm so hard on people and I, and I hate myself for it, but I imagine getting into that type of business, you probably see a very negative part of humanity, right? Yes. Yes. It's because, you know, people are hangry, right? The yeah. people's worst comes out when they're, when they're like yeah. that. 
need a Snickers. I mean, exactly right. <laughs> a lot of insight in that commercial. Um, okay. So what's the, tell me about the second business. So second business was founded not too, uh, not too long after I sold the first one. And it's a rating platform called Know Your BC. So this really came about, it was in the middle of 2017. And if you can remember what was going on in both Silicon Valley and in Hollywood, it was really the start of the whole Me Too movement. So a lot of female entrepreneurs were coming out and bravely telling their stories about how, you know, so-and-so major VC was sexually harassing them or so-and-so major VC was treating them versus their male counterparts completely differently. And to me, as, as a male, I thankfully never received any of that sort of unwanted um, advances, but it just didn't sit right with me, right? Building a company is already hard enough and to have that all sort of taken away or all sort of marginalized by a VC is, is just not right. So launched this platform more as a passion project with a few friends and just given the climate at the time, it really did take off pretty quickly because people were craving transparency. And that's essentially what it was, just essentially like a, a glass door or a Yelp for rating angel investors and venture capitalists. And you sold that company? Yeah. So about a year after we founded it, uh, we were approached by a group that owned um, RateMyInvestor.com. So, you know, Rate My Professor is already really big, right? My teacher, you know, they bought it from, from that kind of same group. And it was just a really great fit. They knew how to run that type of business, obviously. And for me, this was never something that I had really planned on spending the next 10, 20 years devoting my life to. Um, but I was passionate about it. And that acquisition was really, I think, the best possible fit for that company where I could still stay close to it as a board member. But for the day to day and knowing how to grow that business, um, it was really off my plate at that point. How, how do you know when it's time to sell? I think uh, it's a little bit like dating too, right? It's really about the other person if you're not looking to sell. So we had we had met the folks um, almost even before we had started the company. I had, I had known this entrepreneur, um, known what him and his team were capable of, and we just kept the dialogue open. And when it kind of came to the time of, us realizing like, hey, the uh, the offers that this person's making is are actually pretty good. We should probably take it now. And the rest of us can realize that this is the best possible outcome for the company and for the people involved in the company, then it's really the right time to, to do it. All right. So tell us about Vino Invest. Uh, when did you start that? And, and why did you start that? Like there's so, there's so much stuff going on. Um, tell us about your motivations there. Yeah, so VinoVest, I started about two years ago, back in 2019. But my story was um, actually investing in wine, which is what our platform helps users do, started a few years after that. I just sold my first company and was just looking for places to invest my money outside of the stock market. And lo and behold, I came across an article talking about all these exotic asset classes that the ultra wealthy are investing in, and they've all beaten out the S&P. So I was like, oh, this is pretty interesting. And one of them was wine investing. And I tried to give it a hand myself and realized that A, I have no idea what wines to invest in. B, even if I had the money to buy those wines, I couldn't get access to them because it really is tough to get your hands on some of these very rare ultra collectible wines. And then number three, I didn't have the proper wine storage. Unlike storing a bar gold or buying a stock, you actually do have real risk with how you store the wine to make sure it's aging properly. And all those things were very, very expensive to get into. And after that, I realized there should be a better solution and eventually created one myself. Okay. So this is a fascinating concept. So the thing that, that, yeah, so <laughs> there's so many places to go. The first thing that I, that I noticed towards the bottom of your landing page, so your landing page, your website is vinovest.co. I can invest a minimum balance of $1,000, $50,000, or $250,000. The more I invest, the lower my annual fee is. And you talk about algorithm, uh, algorithmically selected portfolios of wine. So tell us about what happens here. This is a fascinating concept to me. Yeah, so in terms of behind the scenes, what we do is our team looks at every single bottle of wine as 
the equivalent of an individual stock. So for example, um, a 2013 year of Opus One could be a completely different risk and return profile and potential from a 2014 Opus One because year after year, the climate is different, the supply is different, um, the quality of the wine could fluctuate as well. And we take all of those into account when we're building portfolios for someone. So for example, if you were wanting to only invest in kind of the blue chips, right, the large cap stock equivalent of, of wines, we could do that. There are your equivalent regions in, in France, mainly in Bordeaux and Burgundy that have been producing wine for years and have a secondary market track record of many, many decades. And we can see with a pretty large degree of confidence what that future return profile will look like. On the flip side, there's your equivalent of like a, a Tesla or like a high flying growth stock where there's a little bit more speculation and risk involved. But in our world, this would be maybe a newer winemaker that's up and coming or perhaps a newer wine region that isn't as well discovered. And depending on what the investor wants to get out of um, their experience at VinoBus, we could then tailor their por portfolio and profile to getting those types of wines. Sorry, I was muted. As a consumer, I can, I'm not taking position of the wine. Is that right? You're right. So we actually hold everything for you after we acquire the wines. We'll do the inspections. We'll make sure everything is in perfect condition and put into our professional storage facilities where both the humidity, the temperature, the vibration levels, and the sunset, the sunlight levels are all monitored 24 seven. We also have a pretty robust insurance policy that acts as a protector in case anything happens, even when it is in storage. Okay. So when, what, what, you know, it's, let's say I go in at the lowest level a thousand dollars. Um, I would presume I can put, I could put in more than a thousand dollars and let's say I put $5,000 in. So I'm buying $5,000 worth of wine as an investor. How right. long do I need to keep that for? So wine is a pretty long-term asset class. I would say it's pretty similar to real estate where to be able to see the best returns, you're looking over a five, 10, maybe 15 year horizon. Okay. Um, that's also a pretty interesting point that you brought up is if you put in $5,000 and wanted to get your money realized in five years, we'd be giving you a completely different portfolio if okay. your horizon was in 10 years, because um, unlike stocks, wines have ideal drinking windows. So in a way, it's a little bit like a bond where you know, is it a five-year type of wine? Is it a 10-year type of wine? And we want to be able to make sure that the value of the wine, you're able to get most of the appreciation within your given sort of investment time horizon, so to say. And so let's say it's five or 10 years later and I, and I've, and I want to sell my $5,000 worth of wine. Let's say, you know, I'm not going to ask you to make a prediction on how much it appreciates, but let's just, let's just say it appreciates by 20%. So if my math is right, that's $6,000. But like, Okay, so now I've now I invested five thousand. Now I have six thousand dollars. Like, am I getting a check for six thousand dollars? Yep, as easy as that. So really? we'll actually sell those wines. Um, we'll sell them to any sort of counterparty that makes the highest bid. This could be a wine retailer, a high end restaurant, another investor, um, a wine collector, or auction house. So we tap into a lot of offline partners as well as online partners to provide you the best liquidity possible. Now, it is obviously a much less liquid market than the stock market or crypto. Um, but right. we find by timing the wines, when they reach their ideal drinking window, the demand from the market from a consumption standpoint is a lot stronger than, um, than say if you sold outside of that window. I love this, this is so cool. If I if I was single and I was going to parties and I wanted to impress people, like, yeah, I'm going to invite I have like $5,000 in wines. Oh, no, they, they, they hold it all for me. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's in my vault. <laughs> it's in my vault somewhere. And I would just, you would, gosh, that's great. That's a, that's a great, be like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm, it sounds so cool to be like, I'm, gonna, I'm a wine investor. <laughs> yeah, that's our hope, right? Because like not people, not many people even know that it exists, but the people who do usually associate it with like, oh, you have to be, super rich and old, right? Like someone's rich uncle made a fortune and now they got a massive wine cellar. No one really knows anything past that. It just seems like a lot of work. <laughs> it <laughs> like, is. Like it I is if you do it yourself. Stuff. Like I wouldn't trust myself to like keep wine in the right sunlight level. Come on. Like that's, yeah, I don't that's either. I'm, I'm the CEO of this company and I still have Vino Best 
handle everything for me. So, so tell me about tell me about how you operate the business, right? Like, like I believe you, you know, you have a co-founder and you're the co-founder and CEO of Innovest. How do you de- delineate responsibilities? What are, what are you responsible for? What is your co-founder responsible for? And also, like we were saying prior to um, recording the stream, I, I love your branding. I think the visuals on your side are just so beautiful. They're so easy to understand what you're doing. And I even like your tagline, your quote, simple, modern wine investing. It tells me everything I need to know in four simple words. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And when it comes to splitting up the work or learning how we work best together, Thankfully, Brent, my co-founder and I, we've worked together um, for around half a decade now. Prior to this company, we worked together at a cryptocurrency portfolio management app, and he was head of design, I was head of marketing, so we collaborated pretty much every day on every single piece of material that was outward facing from that company. And at this company, it started out pretty much the same. He was handling everything that was design, product, engineering related, and I was handling most of the marketing and sales. Um, now, since we have grown a little bit since uh, since founding two years ago, we've got an awesome leadership team. You know, we've got a director of sales, director of engineering. Um, you know, people to really start leading our teams, and that's that's been really helpful to put that trust into an awesome early leadership team. And what? Um... Who is your who is the core audience for this? Like, if if someone listening to this might be thinking, "Hey, this is interesting to me," how like how do you know when you're talking to the right potential person for this? I think if you're interested in being invest, you're interested in alternative assets first and foremost, mm-hmm. right? You believe that your portfolio shouldn't be just stocks, bonds, and cash. And once you're there, I think then it becomes really easy to look at what you want out of an alternative asset, right? If you're looking for something long-term, that checks the box. If you're looking for something with lower volatility than the stock market, that checks the box. If you're looking for something that has uncorrelated returns, that checks the box. And once you see that, you know, this is what you really need out of an asset class. There are very few assets that can actually fit all those three um, sort of check boxes. And wine is one of them. So I think once you've really determined what you want out of your diversified portfolio, then you start to go to, all right, which asset classes are right for me? Maybe wine, maybe it's something else. And then you land on what's the easiest way to do it. And that's where we feel like Vino Best is pretty strongly positioned. So you're going up straight up against Charles Schwab and Morgan Stanley, huh? Well, they don't do any wine, so they're coming to us, actually. Same. Oh, really? So we've got we've got some pretty large institutional players that they they don't earn brownie points for just making another mutual fund for their clients, right? They want to be able to offer something that is differentiated, that is novel, and that can help them attract and retain clients. So not only are we for everyday retail investors, we want to be able to allow professional investors as well to have an easy and low cost way to get into this asset class that. To your point, traditionally has been very, very hard and complicated to manage. Right. So do you, I mean, as you think about growing the business, where where have your clients, customers, investors come from? And and how are you expanding that into the future? So for now, I'd still say it's mostly retail investors. Um, but we have been getting a lot more uh, interest on the institutional side. It's something that we do plan to have more and more of because for us, we see that as a net benefit to the industry, right? The more dollars are coming in, the better the awareness, the more we can streamline costs due to our economies to scale and also be able to provide everybody a better experience on the liquidity side. So for us, we definitely want to be able to cater to both very different market segments and make it easy in in their own different ways. And so for the next year, year and a half, as you as you think about the business, I mean, we've, you know, we're all living through some of the most tumultuous times in the last hundred years. And no one's, mm-hmm. what I love, what I think is really interesting about this time, I don't love it. I, I don't wish this happened. But as a as a person who follows business and is is fascinated by what's happening with COVID and, and all the sort of really fast changes that are happening in our world, is that <clears throat> no one can claim to be an expert. No one's ever lived through the immense uncertainty that occurs during a global pandemic 
all those people have all are, are done. They're not in business anymore. And most of those people are dead from the 1900s, right? Yeah. So, um, what 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 is happening with the uncertainty in the marketplace? You find investors saying we're going to invest in, in in new and novel ways of you know putting our money into safe places. Do you find what what's the trend that you're seeing as it relates to the uncertainty with with COVID, basically? Yeah, that's an awesome question. I think that was really what the first main question we got was, how did you guys do during COVID? Um, and at least from what we've seen in the numbers and prices that have been reflected, people have been drinking more wine than ever. <laughs> and um, the prices have reflected that. And unfortunately, with other sort of lingering side effects in, in terms of global climate change, the yields on the wine that's produced at the very high level are shrinking every single year too. So that sort of supply and demand dynamic fueled with this sort of COVID driven um, that sort of tailwind that people just want to not sit on their cash and savings because they're not getting anything from it and just start being more active, whether it is wine, whether it is collectibles or baseball cards or just more into the stock market, we're just seeing more activity and more wallet share of each person being deployed into the market. As a consumer, do you, uh, as an uh, for an, for a client, for a customer, for an investor, do we would we get like I'm really interested in this? Would we get like insight into the types of wines and where they come from and like all the kind of like fun cultural bougie stuff that goes along with wine? Like oh yeah, so that's that's really I think um, <laughs> a part of the the customer journey, right? Because we're starting the average person who knows nothing about wine investment and really educating them along the way. So. Our research team is producing um, content that shows you being like, all right, well, this is why I bought this wine for you. This is what makes it attractive. A little bit more background on the producer, maybe the region as a whole, and the outlook. So a lot of times it is very similar to the type of news that you read in the traditional markets that you're like, oh, maybe this is a good reason to buy or sell this one wine. And of course, you can't really get away from wine without the sort of pop culture influence when you have superstars like LeBron and Beyonce and a bunch of others posting photos of like thousands of dollars worth of wine for dinner on their Instagram. We also do see market movements from that. So that's also kind of a fun component of this world where we are seeing big influencers starting to drive the price a little bit, whether they mean to or not. You know, when you think about customer acquisition, are you what what are some of the efforts that you're using to make customer acquisition work for you? Is it influencer marketing? Is it paid media? Like is it PR and press? Like what are the primary factors? Because I imagine retail investors are gonna be a, a very different marketing strategy than going after institutions like Chase and, and JP Morgan, uh, JP Morgan Chase and Citibank and all those larger mm -hmm. institutions. So when we when you think about direct to consumer investment, what are the tactics and strategies you're deploying to make that work? So on the D2C side, we still lead with a lot of our content. Um, our hope is that they rank on SEO and it'll start bringing a lot of traffic. So for people who are interested or searching for those key terms, they're able to first have a really great resource on learning more. And then they look at the company that provided that resource, which is VinoVest. Um, coupled with that, we do use all the sort of traditional performance marketing channels, whether it be Google, Facebook, Instagram, to be able to prospect as well as retarget. And then since we are still such a small company, PR and getting the word out and awareness is absolutely part of that strategy as well, because people can't really invest in something that I don't even know exists. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, very cool. What what else should customers know about you know working with you? Um, you can create a, a a an investment strategy that is based on a, a time horizon, which is very similar to investing stocks and bonds. Um, how risky is this? On average, the volatility of the wine market has been around a third of the stock market. So when you're talking about drawdowns as well as downside risk it's pretty tough for a bottle of wine to significantly lose value unless there was a huge scandal maybe with the producer. Maybe that might even make the price go up actually. Uh, but 
right? Uh, like like yeah. olive oil, right? Like how you buy <clears throat> virgin olive oil and it's not really virgin olive oil. Yeah, maybe that would that would maybe like tank the prices. Like, oh my god, like this was what type of sort of juice you were putting in there. Um, <laughs> But the other one would just be risk of storage, right? If you if you cook it in the sunlight, that wine is worthless. So that's another big component to be mindful of as, as a risk of this asset class because there is ongoing storage cost um, and risk that needs to be mitigated. And, you know, in the last few minutes, Anthony, how can uh, how, tell us how people can find you and, and learn more about VinoVest. Yeah, so we're at vinovest.co uh, as our website. Feel free to scroll around. There's a bunch of great educational resources on the asset class as well as our offerings. And then I try to be pretty accessible via social media. So whenever this is out, um, you can tag our company handle or my personal handle, and we can start the conversation there as well. Awesome. Anthony Zhang, co-founder and CEO of VinoVest. Thanks for being with us today. Awesome. My pleasure.